experience it. Um, you all have uh, certainly, you know your kids best, you know your communities best, um, and especially when, when times are tough and challenging, we wanna make sure that any solutions or um, ideas that we put forth are things that will work for you all. Um, Cause if you all tell us they won't work, um, then uh, we need to find some different solutions uh, cause you are the experts. So our goal today is to share what, again, what we've heard from families on both out of school time programs and school-based mental health um, to highlight what is working um, and maybe where there are some gaps. And hopefully this will help us inform our conversations about your vision and what you wanna see moving forward. Um, so again, where we are in the process for this, uh, we are sort of like right in between these first two bullets in terms of getting informed and setting a vision. So we want to know, like you all are experts on your own experience. Hopefully today um, we will help um, build some expertise on what's going on district wide and how other families are experiencing um, and families overall in the district are experiencing these two issues. And again, all leading into um, a collective vision about what could be better. Um, so again, building on what's working for families um, and then trying to address some of the gaps or challenges we might see. And again, these are some data points today that we've got preliminary info right off the press, but we hope that it is helpful um, when we get to the action phase uh, come January, uh, when we are meeting with policymakers, testifying at public hearings, um, doing digital days of action, posting on social media, that these are things that you can um, uplift and amplify in order to make the case um, for the solutions that you all develop. Um, so we're right where we need to be in terms of the timeline of the process, um, getting data and information and making sure that um, whatever vision and solutions we put forth are representative of DC families and communities and, and what they need most. Um, so quick, quick overview of our survey approach. Um, we did it a little bit different this year. Um, so the, the two surveys, as I mentioned, we're gonna cover today are on out of school time programs and school-based mental health. Um, and what we did this time around is we just did a randomized group. Um, so it was, we surveyed 200 people um, total. And uh, we just, out of all of the folks in our network, we just picked a random 200, but that would still be um, representative of the demographics in the district. So of the 200 people, that 200 mirrors the um, uh, representation in DC for public education by ward, race, um, families with students with disabilities. Um, we looked at income and folks who are um, receiving benefits. Um, so essentially the folks that we sampled are representative or folks that we surveyed are representative sample of families who are in the public education system in the district. Um, and just keeping that going with each survey pool um, so that we have some consistency. Um, also important to note when James goes over the uh, results for the OST survey, this was done in partnership with our wonderful friends and partners at the DC Policy Center. Um, and so uh, we're working in tandem with them to continue to analyze these results and we'll update you when we get sort of the full set. Um, but uh, wanted to just highlight and give them credit for their partnership on this work, both in developing the survey itself um, and the analysis. All right, James, so I'll kick it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. So I'm going to start us off by just walking through, uh, first off, just really briefly what OST programs are, just in case there's anyone new, uh, and learning more about our parent priorities here tonight before we dive into those survey results with DC Policy Center. Uh, as we go through, especially when we're going over the survey results, feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on it right next to me on my phone so I can watch any questions come in as we go through it. But just starting with a quick brief overview of what OST programs are. So OST programs are out-of-school time programs or any programs that go on when students are not in the classroom. So that's before and after school. It can be in the summer, on the weekends, or any other time school is not in session. So say there's a day off from school, it might be that. And why these programs matter is because they help with academic enrichment. They help kids explore new activities they might be interested in and find the joy in school. They help build some of those social emotional learning and building social skills. 
and they're a safe, productive, and welcoming place for caregivers to be when, uh, with force kids to be, sorry, when caregivers are working. And multiple agencies all over the city oversee these programs. We kind of call it the Wild West of programming. So Learn24 has some, so does DCPS. Charter LEAs, Departments of Park and Rec, Child Care Centers. So really, there's lots of different places around that you can find those OST programs. So, and I see Carrie's answered that question in the chat. So we're going to dive into some of these OST survey results. This is uh, some of the preliminary results from DC Policy Center's needs assessment. So this is the needs assessment that y'all worked really hard to get, and they're almost done with it. It should be done in the next few weeks. So we're really excited to see just the final results of this uh, survey. But today we're just going to go over some of the preliminary results. So DC Policy Center surveyed both parents and they also surveyed providers of OST programs to see what they're offering, what kind of issues they're having, uh, and just really working to get a landscape of what OST looks like in the district. So again, they are finalizing it. But some of these preliminary results we're going to look at today are OST program seats and the breakdown of those seats, some information about programs, provider issues, and then parent issues. And this is some of the work DC Policy Center has been doing. But first graph that I want to walk you through is just the OST program seats breakdown. So of the providers they talk to, this is how many seats those providers have open for the school year, the weekends, and the summer programs. And you can see those total counts. So for the school year, they had about 36,000 seats available. For weekends, they have about 8,500 seats available for their programming. And during the summer, they have about 16,000. And then, of course, they have separately the Marion Barry Summer Youth Employment Program. Uh, and those have about 12,500 seats. They're still working to get exact seat totals for DPR, but these are total seats they have available. And it's about a 10% increase from what they've had in the past. Uh, in 2017, around five, six years ago, when they did the survey, they had around 3,200. So it's been about a 10% increase in seats. So we are seeing that there's more seats overall in the city. So going to the next slide. Heading into that seat breakdown, we also have just the predominant race served by each of the providers that they surveyed. So these are total counts, not percentages. So of the programs that they talked to, 85%, the majority of the students they serve are Black. Uh, for ethnicity, the majority are non-Hispanic. And you can see just how many programs are serving each race predominantly. That doesn't mean they aren't serving some of the other races, but the majority of their students are those races. And the majority of programs in D.C. are serving Black students compared to some of the other programs, which makes sense since the majority of public school and charter school students in D.C. are Black students. So it makes sense the majority of these students being served by these programs are Black. And that's kind of the breakdown they have for that. And I'm always keeping my eyes out for any questions that might come up as well. Uh, as for program information, so some of the different stats and program information they found, they found that 72% of community-based organizations have bilingual staff. They didn't specify specifically which language those bilingual staff spoke, but 72% of them do have the ability to speak more than one language compared to schools where around 54% of them self-reported that they had bilingual staff. 64 respondents didn't respond to this question, so it's possible that the numbers might be higher or lower depending where they came out, but most programs have more than half of their staff speaking a second language in addition to English. Uh, as for whether or not programs had user fees, uh, the vast majority of the programs that D uh, that the DC Policy Center spoke to don't have program fees. So 127 of those programs said we don't have fees at all. 10 said yes. 59 of them uh, didn't respond to that question. So it's possible it could be no's or yes. But even if all 59 of those go into no responses or of the no responses go into yes, the vast majority of programs aren't charging families user fees when they sign up for those programs. And this is of some of the publicly funded ones. It doesn't really dive into private programs, which would be different. 
Uh, this is something new. I'm really glad they included this question this year. This is something that we spoke to them about and you all have been pushing pretty hard to find out as well. So they talked and they went to each of the programs and asked, are you doing mental health screenings for students when they come into the OST program? Uh, and the vast majority of program by an overwhelmingly uh, high percentage are not screening, unfortunately. So most of them aren't going in and doing mental health screenings for new students when they come into the programs. 155 of them said they aren't. A few of them said they are screening them occasionally, but the vast majority aren't screening them for any mental health needs. Um, as for the programs that do screen, uh, the survey didn't ask specifically how they're screening or what kind of questions they're asking for mental health screenings. So that might be a follow-up DC Policy Center does later to figure out exactly how they're screening them once they're in. But vast majority, unfortunately, are not looking at mental health screening. Uh, this is something that I thought was really important, especially when we're thinking about some of our needs, especially some of our needs of students with disabilities, English language learning students. They asked this year uh, whether or not staff are getting training for helping students with additional learning needs, which can include students with disabilities, can include English language learners, but also a few other groups and characteristics. Uh, and roughly 49%, so 49% of the programs responded, yes, we are offering training uh, for students with additional needs. Now that could be one or the other. So it could be a lot of them are saying we're doing just ELL, a lot of them doing just students with disabilities. The survey didn't ask specifically which groups, just whether or not they were offering at all. 32% of them aren't offering any kind of additional training for staff for learning needs. And 19% of them are not sure whether or not they're providing this, um, but we can see a little under half are providing training for additional learning needs, 49%. And then moving into some of the main issues that providers and parents identified from their surveys. So some of the main issues providers mentioned, uh, one, student enrollment and attendance varies greatly. Sometimes they have lots of students signing up, sometimes they don't. And even when they have students signing up, sometimes the attendance varies. So some students might not be coming regularly for a variety of reasons. Uh, we've talked about this a lot and there's legislation in the work for it right now, but it does take a long time to secure clearance for staff, sometimes multiple months, so they aren't able to hire some of the staff that they need to support um, their programs. Third, and this kind of ties in with the second point, is that there's a lack of staff and high turnover. So even when they're getting staff, they have to wait a long time to get them approved. And the staff they do have tend to leave rather quickly, which makes it harder to support their programs. Uh, fourth, we got not enough funding and funding timing. So just making sure that there's more funding for them. And they're saying that funding typically doesn't come on time. And lastly, they said a lack of consistent space. And sometimes it's hard to get commitment and communications from schools. So they aren't always sure where they're going to be holding their program and whether or not they're able to have those programs in localized locations like schools. And then main issues parents mentioned, a lot of these are similar to things that we've talked about in the past, just as pay, but first, a lot of programs are far away, hard to get to, so you might have to travel far distances to get to a program that interests your student. Affordability, especially for summer and some of those higher quality programs. Difficulties finding programs and enrolling. Uh, concerns around COVID and COVID safety. And then lastly, just a breakdown of communication from programs and schools, meaning parents don't always know what programs exist, how to sign up, how to get there, and don't have all the information they might need. So those are some of the preliminary results that the DC Policy Center went over. But what we're going to do now is just take some time as a group, either to share out, ask questions, whatever you prefer, to talk about some of our reactions. So what surprised you? What were you not surprised to see? Were there any results that really stuck out to you? And does this impact your view of what needs improvement around out-of-school time programs? And you can either come off mute, raise your hand, whatever works best for you. And yep, we can also go back to any slides if helpful. Um, I'm curious about wards. Did you get any information um, based on wards and out of school time, or was this just a, co a combination of all the wards? 
Right now, it's a combination of all awards. I'm hoping when they release the final report, and typically DC Policy Center does break it down by awards. So once the final report comes out, we should have that ward by ward breakdown. Caitlin, I see your hand raised if you want to go. Uh, you know, just every time I, I look at that list of the different, like, website organizations that have these programs it's just it just always strikes me as how overwhelming it is to to try to find a, a program you know and look through all those sites i just i wish there there was a, a more comprehensive search for this type of program for yeah that's all yeah absolutely hey how you doing this is deshaun glad deshaun uh, what's going on, James? How you feel this evening? <laughs> Pretty good. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, I think uh, just for me, uh, seeing that they have issues with um, staffing and high turnover and uh, getting clearances um, seem to be a, a really big issue. Um, just in my mind, thinking about how they would be able to count the number of students uh, they will be able to serve if they're not even clear on the amount of staff they'll actually have at certain centers or facilities or, or in programs. Yeah, definitely. I think from my understanding, the like the total counts of enrollment that they have right now are what they can currently serve. But yeah, having staff and having staff in a timely manner would make it possible for them to serve even more students. Cool, and then Keisha, go ahead. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I guess I wasn't surprised by the results. I think they're pretty reflective of the things that we've talked about in our meetings. But what did stick out to me was the fact that they're not doing the mental health screenings. And given all of the many conversations that we've had uh, numerous times about where our students are with respect to going in, coming out of COVID, and just dealing with the day-to-day -day things that are going on in their schools, that they're still not prioritizing that. So I'd be really interested in ways that we can make sure that stays on the forefront and that becomes a part of the process and not like, in this way, it looks like not even an afterthought, but like, you know, just kind of elevate it um, and remind folks of the importance of it. Yeah, especially when kids are spending so much time in those programs. I mean, exactly, they exactly. I also think on that one, Keisha, like I know James noted the survey itself didn't share a lot of information about like what that screening is, you know, it just like basically all we know is it's some sort of screening. And so I think that's a good question for us to sort of take to some of our OST provider partners is just for those that are, you know, for those limited ones, we can find out who they are that are doing it. Like, what does that look like? What's their practice? Exactly. Um, Cause sometimes I think like, I want screening to be done in a like competent, you know, trauma informed way. Like I don't mm -hmm. mean to minimize the expertise it takes, but I do also think that like, we don't have to make it a mountain, um, you know, every time there are some small and informal things, uh, or relatively informal things that we can do, um, in terms of like checking in, you know, doing wellness checks, there can be some, you know, more, um, robust ones, but I, I think there's a spectrum. And so I, I think that's worth like digging into to see what's the right fit. I'm um, offering a menu of options for providers, depending on, um, you know, if they're after school summer, how often they're at kids, are they school-based outside of it? Like, I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting direction to look into, um, and dig into, um, and see like, you know, the, the other result we don't have is like, what are the next steps after the screen? That's exactly what I was going to say, Carrie. You took yeah. it out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> like what happens once you do the screening? Like then what? You know, yeah. then what? But I, I, I was on the same page with you in terms of like, what does the screening look like? And I wouldn't have an expectation that it would be, you know, the mountain because I wouldn't think that these people are necessarily experts in mental health. But I think it's a, a important pulse check uh, to know 
you know, where the kids are when they come in and what kinds of supports they might need and how often, like you said, to your point about whether it's after school every day, or if this is, you know, an out of school pro uh, program only on like Veterans Day or, you know, some other infrequent time. So those are definitely things I would like to get more information on. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, this is Renee. Um, I'm just waving from the car. Um, I have I have a lot of questions about the survey design to see whether or not there will be was there a question fully asked about whether the young person in the family community in the survey had IEPs 504. My, my memory of what I think the survey design looked like was that, well, no, there was no way for the parents to, to disclose in the survey whether any of the young people in their household had IEP or 504. Is, am I correct in remembering that? I can double check for you. I've got the, the survey up on another screen when I'm not uh, screen sharing this, but if I'm remembering right, they did ask if you had yeah. before an IEP. Yeah, they asked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think, uh, Renee, this, this trend is going to continue when we get to school-based mental health too, is we just wanted to share with you like the results basically as soon as we could get them. Um, but there's definitely still some more like digging and splicing to do um, based on that. I, I know um, uh, Renee had mentioned like getting some ward-based data too. So there'll be more follow-ups to come for sure. Um, but that they did ask that question explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they also asked a few other questions specifically around special needs. One question they asked uh, was whether or not like you hid an IEP from a program because you were worried the program wouldn't accept your student if they knew they had an IEP. So there's a lot of like, I think, really important questions in there that I am interested in seeing the results of. Hey, thank you guys. Uh, is it possible that we could see it? Is it possible for us to see the survey? Sure. Yeah, I can send it to you. Okay. Thank you. you can thank put you. It in a follow up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Any other comments or questions, reactions? How how much time would, could we have to provide further reactions? Like, would you guys like for us to put our really specific comments in writing or would there be a chance to do one-on-one? Uh, yeah, excuse me, I'm in the middle of uh, get, hustling to get to a school-based open house for high school, shopping for high schools now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little I'm a little distracted today, so. But yeah, I, I, I'm willing to do a deeper dive than the Zoom call to take a really sharp look at this. So pet, pet, that is since it's time, my pet subject here. <laughs> but yeah, uh, what is the deadline or timeline would they expect feedback from PAVE? You know, would there be time to do it over the holiday or, you know, just, just kind of curious. Oh, anytime, Renee. Anytime. <laughs> in terms of the statements, um, that might that timeline is a little tighter. Um, so if you want to share any uh, feedback that you think comments or reactions on this that you think might need to like significantly alter the directions of the statements, um, then uh, then we can definitely you know touch base with you ASAP. Um, but uh, I think broadly, this is an always going to be an ongoing conversation, um, certainly. Um, I see lots of folks, I see Taishi even nodding too, um, in terms of like follow-ups and small groups. So, um, and I think, you know, I, I certainly don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, um, but I, I know, I think it was like what Keisha named that um, a lot of this feels familiar in terms of what the like themes of conversations we've had so far, um, which isn't good in terms of like, it's not good that this is um, 
that there are these issues and challenges still popping up, but it's like validating to know, you know, we were on the right track, we're taking things in the right direction. So I would just say if there are any like major things that you think isn't reflected in our statements and solutions already that we might want to incorporate, that's the most time sensitive part. And I will say once the DC Policy Center, uh, like the full needs assessment gets released, I'd love to find time to like break into it and break it down because I'm sure there's going to be a lot more important stuff than just what we went over today, especially like breaking it down by ward, race, income level, and then just a few of those additional questions that like they haven't gotten the chance to put in the report quite yet. And then, uh, and then again, I want to talk about it in the terms of real policy making. Like, what about opinion polling? You know, at, at some point, would it be possible to do a larger data sample and do a real opinion poll about quality? A quant not, this is a quantitative survey, but now we can look at uh, uh, potentially opinion polling for, for, for this to see if there's other public policy things that we can talk to the, uh, our uh, representatives about too. Mm -hmm. Like more, more of a... But anyway, or um, so that's all. So that's that's my policy wonk hat, taking the hat off now. But <laughs> well, thanks, Renee. We're happy to follow up about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, if anyone has any other thoughts, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, but I think I'm going to pass it over to Carrie now, just so we could take some time to dive in and start talking about the results of our school based mental health survey. All right. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. So first things first, um, you know, we are all uh, family here. Um, you can go to the next slide, James. But um, we always want to begin when we're talking about school-based mental health um, and just note that um, this can be heavy. School-based mental health can be heavy. Um, we're all coming to this work from different spaces, experiences, perspectives, um, carrying different things along with us. And so, um, you know, some of what we will talk about today, you know, it's possible it could be um, difficult or triggering. And we just want to name that and acknowledge that from the beginning. We know this is really personal. Um, so at any point you need to take time or space as we discuss this, um, please feel free um, and just let us know if we can support you. Um, and again, we're always here. You're in a safe space full, full of love. So with that caveat um, and just naming that at the beginning, uh, when we are talking about mental and behavioral health, um, you know, you've seen many of you have seen this before. So we just want to name this. It encompasses many, many things, um, whether you call it mental health or behavioral health. Um, you know, folks have different preferences for um, that term, but ultimately we mean this big umbrella, big bucket of things that includes physical health, um, wraparound services, culture and climate. Um, being able to talk about substance abuse, restorative practices. Um, there's tons of things that can fall under this bucket and umbrella. Uh, we won't be able to touch on all of them today, um, but just know uh, all of the things that are important to you under mental and behavioral health are, are also important to us. And we'll do our best to make sure to share any information or follow-ups on anything we don't get to today. Um, because this is certainly not an exhaustive list, nor was it an exhaustive survey, um, but we want to do our best to give you some of the top information about what we do know. Um, so going into our survey results, um, first things first, go ahead, James. Um, we just wanted to, if you if you like have to hop right after this slide um, for the rest of this coffee chat, if you are picking your kids up from school or heading off to work, um, or if you're like us and your Wi-Fi is wonky um, and you have to hop after this, the, the big takeaways that we got from the survey results um, are first is that overall, um, the caregivers who took our survey are, are largely happy um, with the learning environments that schools are providing for their kids. Um, we'll get into specifics of all of these in just a second so you can see the breakdown, but um, overall, there's... Um, uh, from the folks that we surveyed, there's pretty positive remarks. Now, on the other hand, um, probably the biggest concern that came up uh, from the survey results is while there are so many people who are unsure of school-based mental health resources um, at their kid's school. Uh, and, 
And that in terms of like, again, we'll get into this shortly, but in terms of like what the steps are, how to get access to information, if there are supports available, um, the, the question marks uh, came in strong uh, through this survey. <coughs> Just really calling on uh, the need for better information sharing and family engagement um, about what sort of sources uh, of support are available, how to access them, and then of course making sure people feel comfortable um, and that those taking those supports and that those supports are high quality. Um, and so while there are there's information and services provided in a variety of different ways, um, which in some ways is good, um, we want to have there be almost like no wrong door to get that information. Um, there isn't a consistent or centralized way of sharing that information and services um, that's causing a little bit of confusion and uncertainty. Um, so overall, those are like the biggest, biggest takeaways um, from the results, but we'll dig into the overall results um, <coughs> now. Go ahead, James. Um, so first thing, again, as I mentioned, in terms of learning environments, so vast majority of um, parents uh, of survey respondents either strongly agreed or agreed, um, just north of 80% of folks that either strongly agreed or agreed that their child had a supportive school culture and learning environment. Um, so again, largely favorable here. You can go to the next one. Um, and then when thinking about uh, if your child had a mental or behavioral health challenge, how often did survey respondents feel like they got the help they needed? And we've got a couple of slides uh, for you here. <coughs> you can stay on this one for now, James. But uh, first, we just wanted to note that just under half of our survey respondents noted that this question wasn't applicable to them. Um, their child did not necessarily need help with a mental or behavioral health challenge at the time of response. Um, but uh, there's a good number of people who, out of the folks that did um, at one point have a mental or behavioral health challenge with their child. Now you can go to the next one, James. Um, <coughs> excuse me, y'all. We've got the breakdown of uh, how often that uh, survey respondents felt like they got the help they needed. So um, there was not quite half, um, just shy of 40% of folks said most of the time they got the help that they needed. Um, there was uh, about 23% who said every time. Um, so largely, again, the majority of folks were in the uh, positive uh, category here of getting support they needed. Um, but there was also 15% of people only said some of the time they got help, 17% said rarely, and 5% said never. Um, so there's definitely some work to do here uh, to dig into this um, to see what were some of the reasons uh, why folks weren't able to get that support that they needed for their child um, if they reached out. Go ahead, James. Um, now, thinking about availability of resources um, at uh, kids' schools, and again, oh, one thing I meant to note uh, when we were talking about this survey is I think a big lesson for me um, after we did just like a, for if you're, uh, for those of you who are able to join us for the All Ward Learning Day on the 3rd, we did like a really quick super fast poll just to like get a pulse check on how people were feeling about um, school-based mental health supports. And a lot of the like um, conversation right as we were taking the poll was like, well, it's like, I don't know how to answer this when I have multiple kids um, because it's different for my, one of my kids' school than another school, different experiences, which is totally true and accurate, completely valid. And so when we were designing this survey, we wanted to make sure that um, any parent who took this had the opportunity to answer for each of their kids who are school age. Um, and so when James aggregated this data all together, this is for um, all of the kids um, uh, that parents uh, responded for, not just like for one household overall. Um, so I just wanted to note that as we're going through these answers that this is like individual child specific responses, not just overall households. Um, so 
in noting that, um, thinking through what supports uh, were available through their children's school, um, I think the biggest thing here is, again, to call out a third of people responded that they weren't sure. Um, and I think that's a really critical, like part of what we've been talking about with school-based mental health and your campaigns for so long is pushing for more supports, pushing for better quality. Um, and what this calls out to me is that in some way, in some cases, we've gotten the wins to make those supports possible um, and available in schools, but we're still not meeting our actual true goal if that's not getting connected to families. Um, so even if you're, if you're, or um, increasing clinicians, even if we're increasing trauma-informed training or uh, mental health resources to share with families, um, school by school, if folks aren't aware of them, if they're not um, able to access them uh, because of this lack of information sharing, um, then we're still not doing the work justice, and it's definitely something we'll have to hone in on. Um, there were uh, a couple of, like, a variety of different other um, supports that folks named in terms of like, there were some people who got resources or tips, um, mental health workshops, individual appointments, um, uh, or opportunities to engage as a family with mental health professionals. But um, the, the biggest call out to me is the amount of folks that weren't sure at all. Um, so the next one is really honing in on mental health professionals explicitly. So while just over half of respondents noted that they did have access to a mental health professional at school, um, again, in this case, it was even more than a third, uh, almost 40% of respondents noted that they were not sure, um, and 8.5% uh, noted they did not have access to a mental health professional at school. Um, so we need to make sure that given all the work and investment that the city has done uh, to increase access to mental health professionals, we need to make sure that this gets to 100% absolutely as soon as possible. Um, now, uh, tied to information sharing, but also tied to sort of processes, processes that are set up at school, um, is referrals. So if uh, somebody notices, whether it's a parent, an educator, somebody at the school staff notices that a child is having uh, an issue or challenge with um, mental or behavioral health and wants to get them some help, um, we wanted to see how many, how folks um, were experiencing the referral process or knowing um, if your child's school has a process when that challenge or issue is identified, what does it look like to get connected um, to the appropriate school or community-based mental health services? Um, and 40% of folks said, yes, like I know what the referral process is, my child's school has one. Um, this was even more than half of folks, about 55% said they weren't sure about what the referral process is, um, and 5% said no, there isn't one. Um, we've heard this from a number of folks, um, both parents trying to figure out this process and navigate it. We've heard it from parents who are also teachers or teachers themselves about like, I've, I, I see this happening, but I'm not sure what to do next. I don't really know what my next steps are. Um, and this is one of those tricky things that really is particular school by school, because um, it depends on the staff structure, um, who is in place, who's in charge of what, because the teamings and responsibilities might look different school by school. Um, but regardless of those differences, it's still important for every school to have a process and have it be clearly communicated so everybody knows what to do um, whenever, you know, we, we recognize a need for a student. Um, and this is an area that definitely needs to be improved because it's not happening um, in, in a lot of schools or at least that's been communicated to parents. Um, so this one was really interesting. So we've talked a lot about the importance of information sharing um, and how folks have found out about mental health services at schools. And again, like what I think I've heard from parents over the course of the years is 
I want to be able to go to anybody at my child's school and feel like they know the answer for how to get me help. And if they don't know the answer, making sure that they connect me to the person who does know the answer and not get the runaround. Because I've heard that from a lot of people is, oh, I don't know the answer, but go to this person. And then you go to that person, and that person doesn't know the answer and go to this person. So what I think is interesting about this pie chart that you can see is, is really broken up is whether it be teachers, special education coordinators, um, deans or assistant principals, principals themselves, other school staff members, um, a friend or colleague, fellow parent. Um, there's lots of different people uh, that um, parents and survey respondents are going to to get support. They're also about just over a quarter of folks um, noted that it was just from communication from the school. So it wasn't necessarily directly from a person, but maybe it was in an email, a newsletter on a website. Um, so there's there are different ways that folks have been able to access um, information about what services are available. Um, but I also want to call out the uh, another big takeaway for, for us on this slide is that uh, almost 18% of folks said that no one has ever communicated about uh, mental health services at their school, um, which is really alarming uh, when you think about how important um, and sometimes time sensitive that information is. This might be something that you think you don't need it. Um, and then when you do, you really do. Uh, and you wanna be able to either go back to an email, go back to a resource um, yourself or, or pick up the phone and call a person you have a relationship with and, and know that you'll be able to get access to the support. Um, so that's definitely something uh, to keep in mind. And also to note that if this is the variety of folks um, that parents may be reaching out to about school-based mental health supports, making sure everybody on this list knows that referral process, knows the menu of options, um, and can communicate that information to school communities, or at least make sure families are getting connected um, to the right person who can sort of walk them through those steps. So this was illuminating to us to be able to see like it really does take a village um, and we need to make sure everybody in the school community is equipped with this knowledge and information. All right, um, so we'll pause there. Uh, and just want to see if there are any questions or reactions to the data that we have so far, anything that was surprising or not, um, anything that stuck out to you or, or things that we might want to think about in terms of our um, impacting our, our statements of beliefs and solutions. Go ahead, Keisha. So the things that stuck out to me were the the lack of information, I think it's beyond troubling that 18% of the people have no idea. But I think it's equally troubling that it's you can find the information in so many different places because what that says to me is that there's no centralized place for people to find information. So I know to look here because Carrie told me. I know to look there because James told me. But there's not a centralized repository of information to share uh, for parents. And that's that that's troubling because that means it's just up to hearsay or word of mouth or you know, some other means. And so if there's something that we can include, um, I would certainly like to include something about information sharing, um, not the importance of it, but demanding that it be done. And sure. I don't know, I guess the challenge for me is I don't know why it's not being done because all the schools send like weekly emails and information and things like that. And I know I've heard some of the paid parents talk about, you know, that they get this kind of information from their schools, but there's so many that don't, right? Based on this survey and even to Renee's point, I think it would be reflective. Even if we surveyed 600 people, you would probably end up with the same result for this particular issue. Mm -hmm. And so I wish, you know, there's a way for us to push schools to include this kind of information in the weekly emails, in the newsletters, on their websites, like they all have websites. Um, till we get to a point where we have something for school-based mental health similar to like um, the lottery or, yeah. you know, just some sort of place for it. But we have to be able to get people information because what's happening to the children if the parents don't have the information? Yeah, completely agreed. And I know that's 
at least somewhat component of your um, statement of beliefs, uh, like, you know, outlining what's needed um, to improve information sharing. But what you're saying, Keisha, what's what that calls upon for me is to your point, there are some schools that are doing this, you know, and like what's working, what's the right, like what's a good, helpful, effective set of strategies um, and ways to share this information um, and how can we sort of like build that example to make sure that if schools aren't using those strategies right now that that we're pushing them to. Um, so I think that's a good follow up for us is that for folks who do know the answers to these questions um, and what's available, how they find out um, what worked, what didn't and put that together. Thanks, Keisha. Other folks? Artemis, I'm going to take a guess. Whereas your comment in the chat when I was referencing uh, different experiences for um, different kids, depending on their school. Yes, it was. <laughs> Do you want to speak to that at all in terms of some of the answers you saw? Fair enough. I put you on the spot. I appreciate you, though. <laughs> another time, another time. Oh, Davinia, do you want to speak to that? I think your comment in the chat is actually really helpful, um, noting it's in line with school, but uh, like in terms of the communication platform, the information that was shared, I think that's really helpful. Um, sure. No, um, it's just uh, uh, my husband has a phrase, there's a lot of information, but no communication. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about but generally, you know, mental health is a thing and all of this thing. And I think people's, uh, this is not a judgment on people's intent, but the reality is um, uh, like, if it's not like an IEP kind of situation, but you want to like, you see, you see some things that you want to follow up with and you, and like I said, I just checked now and there's nothing like, I don't know who to go to um, unless I went to I, I don't even know, actually, I'm just trying to think all the time, like, who would, who would be my first point of reference? And you don't know, you don't want to go to principal, clearly, you don't want to go to, so you you don't really know who is a point of contact. So um, I, I think the school's intention, and there's somebody would be there to help me, but it, it's like another person said, you would um, have to talk to someone, and it would send you to somebody else, probably, yeah, or talk to another parent, and and you know you want that confidentiality and all these kind of things so um it, anyway so it all is all in line with the results um said uh, but, yeah uh, I appreciate you I really appreciate you sharing that thank you um and I think that just makes me think you know in terms of um going to somebody you know if the only contact information is behavioral health um, and I don't mean to discourage this or like you said, you know, it's nothing about the intentions or the, the nature of the Department of Behavioral Health itself. But, um, you know, when mental health is so personal, you want to go to somebody, you know, um, and sometimes it's hard enough for folks to ask for help um, to begin with uh, and doing so to someone, hopefully that you have a connection to a relationship with that knows you, that knows your child um, can make a big difference. Um, and so I think that's an important, like DBH can be one option on the list, but um, there should be others um, in order to support people through this process. So I really appreciate you sharing that. It's a good example of, um, you know, something that can, a concrete uh, step for improvement. Uh, Carrie? <laughs> Hi. Oh, 
well, this is this is the part of this is the part where I go into my speech. Where I think about it as being, now where's my damn therapy dog when I need it? You know, it it really burns my gut that when our children are experiencing mental health as a crisis, and we and we're in crisis, and when the children are as writ large are are experiencing like kind of like a more mass crisis intervention of mass-based trauma that when you see the video footage and newspaper coverage of other communities, you see the troops rushing in with therapy dogs, mental health support, counselors, brief counselors are provided. And I don't ever see that narrative routinely or, or fairly provided with DC, with urban kids. Oh, they're used to it. Oh, they're just going to go to their peers to get support. Oh, that happened outside of school. If it happened, if the trauma happened outside of the schoolroom, with well, that's not our problem. That happened outside. Your parents should do this follow up. Your parents should do the follow up. Your your doctor should do the follow up. And I just want to continue to really recent recenter the, <coughs> the the problem. The original thing that got me interested in this issue um, was the South Capitol Street. Um, a massacre that had happened when I first came back from um, overseas, and I went and I first had Alexa as a to- was a, Alexa was a toddler when um, a group of kids had like their first mass shooting event incident that had happened like in kind of like in a modern way, you know that the the kids were coming home from a funeral of a classmate, and then they decided to go and hang out and gather in South Capitol Street just to talk just to process what happened after leaving the funeral for this, for one of their friends. And then they were, they were shot, you know? So I, again, I, I just want to kind of keep that, keep both perspectives on that. Like, you know, we don't just, we, we not only want the mental health supports in, a, in the context of responding to global events, global trauma, global, global uh, school-wide events or school specific events, but we also want to have the other side of supports, which is, the ongoing identification and normalization of help, help and supports yep. for all for all people in the building. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But that was a soapbox. I know that was a soapbox, but I'm gonna step off of it now <laughs> and, and pause and meet. I think it's important to name, you know, just how urgent and important this work is. Um, and uh, so I, I appreciate you regrounding us in that, Renee. Um, And I think that's the sentiment that we will leave this conversation on, uh, looking at at time. So James, if you wanna move to next steps. Um, So as we mentioned, uh, we've got um, some disaggregated results um, coming soon, but we wanted to share that information uh, and results as at least the initial ones as soon as we could. Um, If you are a PAVE PLE board member, um, please let us know if you have any thoughts on, on how this should be included in your statement of beliefs. Um, if you feel like you, there's something that still needs to be reflected there. Um, and for everybody, um, uh, particularly if you have folks who aren't on a PLE board now, one, we'd love to have you uh, in the future. But two, if you just want to learn how to get uh, more involved um, in our campaigns about school-based mental health and uh, OST programs and hopefully expanding access to those um, important uh, supports and services t- uh, across the district, please just reach out to us. We'll send you a follow-up email today um, so you have information uh, about how to get in touch with us. But we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you again um, for everybody coming out today. And I'll pu- we can stop there. You know, the last step is always to take a picture. Um, so, uh, James, do you mind if I kick it over to you to, to snap a quick photo? Um, and I'll just ask if folks are able to come back on camera so we can see your faces for the picture. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm ready to go for the photo. So go ahead, come off camera if you're ready. And we're going to go ahead and take that first shot in three, two, one. All right, and that's the first page. And then let me go ahead and get the second page. So we'll do it again. looking good on this Tuesday. I love it. Two, (laughs) one, and here's the second photo. Thank you, everybody.
All right. Thanks, y'all. We appreciate you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a great evening. Guys. Thank, Thank you. Buddy. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ashani. Great work, Dave. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. We just let Anna in. Hey, Anna, we just ended. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're good to go. Good to go. Oh, MG. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you the recording now. Mm -hmm. Okay. We love you. Bye. Uh, <laughs> All right. I think Glenda's frozen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. James, I Bye. definitely I feel so bad. I was not trying to take over your facilitation of the Q and A for OST. I was trying to give you a chance to go look at Taisha's question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're like, good. Yeah. So sorry. <sighs> well, I think that went okay. Yeah, I think so. Did the job. There are a couple of people. I don't, I mean, I'd be curious. Maybe they came to something at some point, but there are a couple of names I didn't really recognize. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So once we like calculate it, we'll see. Once yeah. I put the maybe we got a little uptick. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, go team. Thanks everybody. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.